Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, because without you we are not able to please you, mercifully grant that your Holy Spirit may in all things direct and rule our hearts. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson comes from Proverbs 1 verses 20 through 33. It is titled, Warning Against Rejecting Wisdom. Let us hear the word of the Lord. Wisdom calls aloud in the street. She raises her voice in the public squares. At the head of the noisy streets, she cries out in the gateways of the city. She makes her speech. How long? Will you simple ones love your simple ways? How long will mockers delight in mockery and fools hate knowledge? If you had responded to my rebuke, I would have poured out my heart to you and made my thoughts known to you. But since you rejected me when I called and no one gave heed when I stretched out my hand, since you ignored all my advice and would not accept my rebuke, I, in turn, will laugh at your disaster. I will mock when calamity overtakes you, when calamity overtakes you like a storm, when disaster sweeps over you like a whirlwind, when distress and trouble overwhelm me. Then they will call to me, but I will not answer. They will look for me, but will not find me. Since they hated knowledge, it did not choose to fear the Lord, since they would not accept my advice and spurn my rebuke, they will eat the fruit of their ways and be filled with the fruit of their schemes. For their waywardness of the simple will kill them, and the complacency of fools will destroy them. But whoever listens to me will live in safety and be at ease without Fear of harm. <laughs> this is the word of God. Please join me in the reading of Psalm 19.
The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims God's handiwork. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. In them God has set a tent for the sun, which comes forth like a bridegroom leaving his chamber and runs its course with joy like a strong man. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Moreover by them is your servant warned, and keeping them there is great reward. Also keep your servant from the insolent, let them not have dominion over me. Then thou shalt be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my God and my Redeemer. Amen. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples, and he said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? 
those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord, Lord Christ. Christ. You may be seated. If we read Jesus' words honestly, if we read the Gospels honestly, we sometimes get a picture of him that's very different from gentle Jesus, meek and mild. Um, a great hymn by Charles Wesley, of course. But we caught a glimpse of that last week. Today we heard Jesus identify this adulterous and sinful generation. Something that resonates with us, right? Now, this isn't Jesus' way of talking about kids today, right? This is how Jesus names what lies at the foundation of society and power. He isn't simply pointing out what's wrong with a particular generation. He's naming what has defined every generation since Adam. I don't know how many generations are represented in this room, but whoever you are, Jesus is pointing at your generation. We're up to the same old games humanity has always played. We are cheats and sinners. We lie and steal. We kill one another. This adulterous and sinful generation. Jesus names the problem that has dogged us since the beginning. Naming a problem is important. It's the first step toward recognizing it and enacting solutions to the problem. But Jesus doesn't just name the problem for us. He leads the way out of it. This morning's gospel lesson is at the center of St. Mark's account of the story of Jesus, and it marks a central transition in his life. Up to this point in the story that Mark is telling, things are going smoothly, more or less. Jesus performs miracles, heals the sick, feeds the hungry. But after this point in the story, things get more complicated. There is more hostile opposition, more arguments, and Jesus keeps going on and on about his impending death, as we heard today. From this moment on in the story, everything leads to the cross. And so it's no surprise that this moment is at the center of St. Mark's message. Jesus and his disciples are on the road. They're heading to some villages. And on the way, Jesus asks them a question. Who do people say that I am? He says, you've been with me. You've heard what people are saying. They tell him, some think you're John the Baptist. Others, Elijah. Others, one of the prophets. Basically, no one's too sure. Then he makes it personal. But who do you say that I am? This is the question that matters. Not what do other people say Jesus is. Who do you say Jesus is? When we read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the disciples are usually stand-ins for the readers. This was an ancient practice when writing about Jesus. The author wants us to know that when Jesus gives a sermon or asks the disciples a question, it's probably pointed at us. And the central question at the heart of Mark's gospel is the most important question Christians can ask themselves. Who do I say Jesus is? As we follow Jesus, this question hangs over us. It will orient our entire lives with God. And the church is the community that has grappled with this question for the last 2,000 years. Every adulterous and sinful generation has to find an answer to the question, who is Jesus for us today? So St. Peter speaks up and he says, who do we say you are? You're the Messiah. 
You are God's anointed prophet, priest, and king. Now he's given a good answer. But almost immediately, things go bad for St. Peter. Peter, like everyone else waiting for the Messiah, expects a champion. He expects a warrior king to lead Israel to freedom. If Peter were to look up the word Messiah in his culture's dictionary, that's what it would have told him. The Messiah is God's chosen leader who will defeat the Romans and restore the kingdom of Israel. And Peter wants to follow that guy. He wants to follow the guy who comes out on top because when the Messiah wins, so will the people who chose to follow him. But like most things with God, Jesus subverts Peter's expectations. Jesus immediately starts talking about his own fate. The Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed and be raised in three days. This is when Peter, who thinks he knows who Jesus is because he uses the right words to describe him, speaks up again. It's almost like he interrupts Jesus and says, I can't talk like that, boss. So don't talk like that. If you're the Messiah, that can't happen. What Jesus says after Peter's declaration upends everything Peter thought he knew about the word Messiah. See, Peter uses the right words to describe Jesus, but he immediately argues with Jesus over the meaning of those words. But Jesus knows what those words really mean, and he knows his fate better than anyone. And so Jesus tells Peter to shut up, and he calls him Satan. Get behind me, Satan. For you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. That is, don't get in the way of what God has laid out for me. This isn't Peter's best day. You might have noticed that after Jesus asks this question of his disciples, who do you say that I am? And Peter gives his answer. He tells them to keep quiet about it. This is what scholars call the messianic secret in Mark's gospel. And this seems kind of strange, right? If you have found the Messiah, you will want to tell everyone. I think part of what is happening here in this messianic secret is that Jesus told the disciples to keep quiet because they didn't know the words they were using. They didn't know how to apply these words Messiah or Christ to Jesus properly. We know this because if they had, Peter wouldn't have argued with Jesus over his fate. As theologians like Wolfhart Pannenberg have pointed out, the meaning of the title first had to be revised by linking it to the crucified, so that instead of a political liberator, a messianic king, they would see a suffering Messiah. This is a great demonstration of meaning in use. Sorry to talk about philosophy, but this is a philosophical theory that seeks to explain how words have their meaning. Rather than some objective way in which a word connects to an object in the world, we understand a word best through the context in which that word is used. We learn words by using them, and it isn't until we know how to use a word in day-to-day -day life that we really understand it. Jesus essentially says to Peter, you have used the right words to talk about me, but I'm going to show you why you don't really understand those words yet. When Jesus starts talking about his rejection and death, he's saying, this is what it means to be the Messiah. I am going to give myself up to death, and it's going to hurt. But death won't win in the end. 
To be God's chosen means to give oneself up for the sake of the world, and that usually involves some kind of pain. When Jesus asks the disciples this question, who do you say that I am? He isn't having an existential crisis. I think I've said this before. He's not saying, who am I? You know, what am I here for? Instead, when he asks his disciples and he asks us this question, he is trying to incite an existential crisis within us. Saying the words, you are the Messiah, is a leap of faith in itself. But really believing those words requires even more from us. Because when Jesus pulls this declaration out of us, he shows us what it really means and he asks us to believe it. No matter how many words we use, the question is never fully answered. We cannot answer this question, who is Jesus Christ for us, with mere words. We have to answer it with our lives. He tells his disciples, they're going to nail me to a cross. If you want to be my disciple, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me there. This is how we learn the meaning of the words, you are the Messiah. He says, if you really believe what you've said about me, if you really want to be a Christian, if you really want to follow my way out of this adulterous and sinful generation, follow me down the road of suffering for the sake of others. Do as I do. See, in God's kingdom, the only way to win is to lose. I think I can safely bet that none of us will actually be nailed to a cross. None of us is likely to be martyred for our faith. As Karl Barth put it, one cannot try to be a martyr. One can only be ready to be made a martyr. So as I've said before, if we're going to seriously consider this demand Jesus places on our lives to take up our crosses, we might have to get a little creative. There are things we encounter in everyday life, though, that are a kind of death. Giving up a bad habit can feel like death. Giving away worldly goods so that others might survive and thrive can be a very painful experience. Forgiveness can feel like dying. Getting hung out to dry and yet facing the world the next day is one of those things that can feel like death. Jesus doesn't want us to be doormats for everyone else, but the world might drag you through the mud once in a while. Dying to ourselves involves suffering alongside Jesus. But he has shared in our pain, and he can see us through. And Jesus leaves us with this reminder. If you want to share in the Messiah's victory, if you really want to win, you've got to lose. None of us make it off this earth alive, but if you lose your life for Christ's sake, you will find it. Amen. Let us confess our faith together. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, 
was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic Church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the Church and for the world. O God, the Creator and Preserver of all, we pray for all people, and especially those in any kind of need through famine, war, or natural disaster. Make your ways known upon the earth, your saving power among all peoples. Help us to lighten their burden and to seek justice and peace for all. Lord, in your mercy, hear us. Guide and govern us by your Holy Spirit, that all who call themselves Christians may be led into the way of truth and hold the faith in unity of spirit, in the bond of peace, and in holiness of life. Strengthen your church in the service of Christ, that we may be witnesses to your compassion. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, spirit, or relationship. Give them courage and hope in their troubles, and bless those who care for them. Lord, in your mercy, we commit to your mercy all who have died. Grant us with them a share in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our we pray for ourselves and our ministries. Give grace to us, our families and friends, and to all our neighbors, that we may serve Christ in one another and love as he loves us. Help us to see anew your image in the child, the stranger, the homeless, and the refugee. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Friends, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.
Friends, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Thank you.